Thanks a lot for that kind introduction. And yes, today I will I will present a couple of reflections concerning sort of the philosophical underpinnings of of the posthuman going back, showing a couple of differences of the posthuman debate. That's why I was I was highlighting also the posthuman studies reader. Um, that's really a wonderful reader, which gives a broad overview to, to anyone. I mean, to, not only to newcomers, but also to experts, um, because in, in one book, um, which was edited by Jan Stasienko and Evi Sampaniko, you can really find excerpts from, from the great variety of different approaches, because the post-human is a notion which, which um, is, is part of many different cultural backgrounds. And that's what I've always found so, so incredibly fascinating. So it's not only critical post-humanism, also transhumanism, meta-humanism, and sort of in order to, in order to enclose in or, uh, to all the different debates, I've, I've used, I'm using the term post-human philosophy. So yes, the post various post-human philosophy. So this is the post-human studies reader. Um, it provides excerpts from the great variety of post discourses. It will be out as a cheap paperback in September. So next month it will be available as a cheap version. So far, only the hardback and the digital version are available. They're also available on Amazon.com, just in order to make it um, obviously accessible. So, But it's my strong recommendation. And another thing in order to um, sort of the journal for academic exchanges concerning the posthuman. I launched the Journal of Posthuman Studies, and we also got two two artists in the editorial board. So Eduardo Kach, who coined the term bioart, as well as Stellar, um, are members of the editorial board, as well as members. You know, for, there are several philosophers, literary studies, cultural studies experts, um, people from engineers. So really create diversity of different disciplines is being represented. And, but the fine distinctions between the various notions, critical posthumanism, transhumanism, and metahumanism, they are often not being understood, properly understood, even by many experts. So that's why um, I, I recommend the readers. It's, it's very important to be clear that there are very different approaches, very different pedigrees very different understandings. On the other hand, they do have some fields in, in common. But um, so not only the educated uh, uh, um, public, but also experts, many experts are still have problems of really using the appropriate kind of terms for the various for the various approaches. The, the cult differences, the culture and backgrounds and ways of thinking are extremely manifold in these approaches. And um, any critical philosophical engagement with them needs to clearly distinguish these three approaches. But they also, on the other hand, share certain aspects, um, certain characteristics, which justifies to refer to all of them as post-human philosophies. And that's why I also you know, like that you said of the, it's post-human art, um, which, which you're concerned with, because post-human is the most inclusive term. And I, I think the following three aspects are uh, the most important ones when it comes to, 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 to explain why the variety of um, cultural movements actually, um, they all represent some kind of post-human philosophy. So first of all, they all use the word post-human. Um, but the, what the post-human stands for, what it means is, is really different. And one always has to focus on what does a specific intellectual thinker actually have in mind when thinking when talking about um, the post-humans, there's a great diversity of different meanings, even within a specific tradition. Um, one always needs to clarify what it actually stands for. So, so even within transhumanism, there are there, there as many concepts of the post-human as, 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 you know, as probably thinkers. The second aspect of post-human philosophies is all of these approaches share that the goal is somehow moving beyond humanism in some way or the other. Um, again, this claim needs further explanation and justification. What does humanism stand for? Many, many scholars also think maybe this, this is a wrong claim. Um, many critical post-humanists, for example, think that transhumanists um, are actually hyperhumanists or they humanists on steroids. Um, they accuse uh, transhumanists of, of not actually trying to move beyond humanism, but they actually like the fulfillment of humanism. I don't think this is the case. I, I think that's a misrepresentation. 
um, because it, it, it's really, it's, a, it's, it's um, based upon a certain reading of mind uploading, which is highly implausible and which no serious transhumanist actually affirms. So one, one has to be extremely careful when engaging, you know, also what humanism stands for, what, what duality stands for, dualist ontology stands for. But all of these movements try to overcome, try to transcend humanism, move beyond humanism in some way or the other. And any critical analysis which takes into consideration the great variety of different approaches within each of these three cultural movements has to come to a different conclusion than the critical post-humanists who claim that transhumanists are actually humanists on steroids. That's not a proper conceptualization of transhumanism. And uh, a third aspect, which is extremely important for the post-human discourses is all of these approaches seriously con consider the impact of emerging technologies. So this, is, this judgment might be slightly less controversial. However, some critical post-humanists, for example, claim that non-duality is more important than the engagement with technologies. On the other hand, if you take non-duality seriously, then that clearly see has implications for human technology relationship, that there is not this dualistic categorical distinction between humans and technologies. Again, we're blurring the boundaries. So, but technology plays a central role and engagement in particular with emerging technologies plays a central role within the post-human discourse. What is clearly different about the variety of beyond humanism approaches is their cultural pedigree. And I use the notion of pedigree because all the movements stress a closer relationship between the human and non-human animals and humans and, and AIs and robots. So critical post-humanism is a further development um, from postmodern philosophies, in particular the postmodern philosophies which come from Deleuze and Foucault. So they're trying they have a very similar approach, a very similar methodology, but they're trying to move beyond this um, with respect to the post-human, with an engagement with technologies. Transhumanism, on the other hand, is rooted in the Anglo-American evolutionary tradition, also more closely related to analytical philosophy. And so it has a completely different way of using language also, and, and the questions they engage with are more, more normative explicitly. Metahumanism, on the other hand, is strongly connected to Heraclitus, the permanent flux, the permanent change, the permanent becoming of everything with respect to any aspect. And it also bears a lot of traces to Nietzsche. And, um, but it is, it, it's connected to the other movement and, 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 and represents an alternative to the other two movements. And the following short characterization try to associate each one of the three approaches with some specific characteristics. So in a, in a nutshell, one could say, critical post-humanism is about thinking and acting in a non-dualistic, non-essentialist, non-anthropocentric, and non-hierarchical manner. That might be critical post-humanism in a nutshell. Transhumanism, on the other hand, affirms the use of technologies for transcending, for moving beyond our current boundaries. And the reason for doing this is, as it goes along, with an increased likelihood of persons living good lives. That's why we should use technologies in order to do so. Silicon-based transhumanism aims for the coming about of a post-human as an uploaded mind. There is silicon-based transhumanism. And then there is, there is carbon-based transhumanism, which regarded as a more plausible that the post-human is a member of the new species or that the post-human still belongs to the human species but has at least one trait which significantly goes beyond the traits currently living human beings have. And so I'm distinguishing also the various notion of critical uh, of, of silicon based transhumanism, carbon based transhumanism in the book, which also came out earlier this year. It's, it's called We've Always Been Cyborgs. Um, and, and that might, it's, it's also, it serves as a very good introduction to transhumanism, but also presents my own perspective. And the most promising technologies for realizing the goals, which I just mentioned, um, for, for carbon-based transhumanists are gene technologies and upgrading persons by means of chips wandering into our bodies, establishing brain-computer interfaces. Then as a third movement, there is metahumanism, and metahumanism is, is um, is an alternative approach. It lies beyond humanism 
but from the way I conceptualize, it also lies in between trans and critical posthumanism. But it's not not everyone conceptualizes metahumanism in this way. There's also um, Jaime del Val, with whom I coined the term together, um, and he, he conceptualizes transhumanism differently from me. So it, it is open to to a great diversity of different approaches, but it um, but sort of matter humanism um, goes back to the ancient Greek matter, which which means both beyond as well as in between. There's a thinking emotions in relations, and matter humanism has some guiding nodal points, but it can also go along with a great variety of different philosophical approaches. So matter humanism's nodal points are plurality, perspectivism, relationality, and a non-dualistic ontology of permanent becoming in all respects. The term posthumanism was originally coined by Ia Pazan in 1977. I, I, let me just quote the, the, the exact passage where he did so. He, he wrote, with regards to posthumanism itself, the most relevant aspect of the Promethean dialectic concerns imagination and science, mind and technology, earth and sky, two realms tending and uh, turning to one. And so here it becomes clear, it's sort of the dualities are getting dissolved. And this is sort of the, the first formulation of that understanding of posthumanism. Um, here in the notion of a posthuman philosophy also arises and he explicitly used the term too. The, the concept of transhumanism on the other hand, it goes back to an article by Julian Huxley from 1951. It, it's most people, you refer to a text from 1957, which is not the case. He already used the term in 1951 in an article where um, Julian Huxley was the first general director of the UNESCO. And, and he also uh, participated in formulated the, the, the Carta of Human Rights. And um, the, the, the decisive passage in which he coined the term transhumanism was the one where he said, such a broad philosophy might perhaps best be called not humanism because that has certain unsatisfactorily connotations, but transhumanism. It is the idea of humanity attempting to overcome its limitation and to arrive at full fruition. It's a re realization that both individual and social developments are processes of self-transformation. The notions of the post and the transhuman, by the way, in the transhumanist sense, because there's a post and transhuman in the transhumanist and one in the posthuman sense, posthumanist sense. So the notion of the post and the transhuman in the transhumanist sense definitely show up in an article entitled Transhumans um, 2000 by S. Fenderary, where he wrote, on our way beyond animal, beyond transhuman to a posthuman dimension. So here it's the evolutionary dimension of post and the trans and the posthuman is being stressed. On the other hand, the term metahumanism was coined by the Spanish intellectual Jaime del Val and, and, and me. And we wrote, metahumanism is a critique of some humanism's fun foundational premises such as free will, autonomy, and the superiority of the anthropoi due to their rationality. It deepens the view of the body as a field of relational forces in motion and of reality as imminent embodied process of becoming, which does not necessarily end up in defined forms or identities, but may unfold into endless amorphogenesis. Monsters are promising strategies for performing this development away from humanism. So transhumanism has, has been referred to as the most dangerous idea in the world by Francis Fukuyama in 2004. And he thereby actually helped transhumanism to become even more famous. In the meantime, transhumanism has gained a lot of public attention. Dan Brown explicitly writes about transhumanism, for example, in his novel, Inferno. And various series talk about um, transhumanist concept from the Big Bang Theory via Westworld, Altered Carbon to Mo Black Mirror. Black Mirror is just amazing. I'm using it, by the way, in, in, in a course entitled Posthuman Studies at, at university. And many and sort of my students can write a write an essay on the episode Nosedive and the Chinese social credit system. Hollywood movies present central transhumanist ideas, for example, the movie Transcendence with Johnny Depp, and 
last but not least, so many leading Silicon Valley entrepreneurs regard themselves as transhumanists, like Ray Kurzweil, Peter Thiel, Martin Rosblatt, Elon Musk. And there's even a transhumanist party in the US and the founded Sultan Istvan was an unsuccessful presidential candidate. And whenever the term post-human comes up in public debates, most people think about transhumanism. That's sort of the more the public awareness in the, in the wider media engagement. It is very different in academia. In academia, most people think about critical post-humanism first. So even though transhumanists show up in popular journals, reports and public debates, they are not being taken so seriously in, in academia. They are rather seen as more intellectual light whites by, by many, undeservedly so, but that, that is a very a widely shared understanding. And there seems to be a um, widely well shared understanding sort of really it's, it's because that they are philosophical lightweights. Um, they don't have that historical understanding. They're more entrepreneurs. They're more people in the AI world, computer sciences. But it's indeed the case that many transhumanists do not have a humanities background. They are more closely related to a linear way of thinking, the relevance of, of scientific data and utilitarian ethics. So that is very different from critical posthumanism. Many judgments widely, widely shared by transhumanists seem to imply an intellectual carelessness, in particular when it's being upheld that personal immortality is close. Um, upon further consideration, it becomes clear that was what was uttered often does not correspond to what was meant. Um, in most circumstances, it merely stands for the affirmation of a prolonged health span. No, no serious transhumanist actually thinks we can become immortal. Critical, um, critical posthumanists, on the other hand, have the appropriate academic training and background for expressing themselves more carefully. Um, they're particularly strong in the fields of gender studies, literary criticism, and media studies. Metahumanism, on the other hand, can be affirmed in many different cultural settings and contexts. And the guiding nodal points of metahumanists can be and are being employed in a great diversity of discourses. It's particularly strong in the artistic context, actually, where ambiguity is not a deficiency, but it can, it's all, can also be seen as an advantage. It has to be stressed that intellectual, artistic, and scientific operations is what are needed actually to, for dealing with the impact of emerging technology. And the best minds of the various tradition and disciplines need to get together and discuss the most pressing issues of our times. And no, no single individual can basically solve these issues or deal with these issues in the appropriate manner. Um, we have to have discussions between intellectuals employing great diversity of different approaches to deal with the complexity of the most difficult contemporary social, cultural, and ethical issues. And that's why Sang Yu Shim from Eva University in, in Seoul, James Hughes and I, in cooperation with Penn State University Press, we founded the Journal, uh, Journal of Post-Human Studies in 2017. And it's also open to uh, artistic submissions. Um, and it's the first double-blind peer-reviewed journal explicitly dedicated to the post-human. And we made, made sure that the price is such that it, it's even like for the layperson, it is accessible, it's, 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 so it's rather cheap in comparison to other academic journals. What I'll be doing here is now to highlight three aesthetic concepts and three aesthetic concepts related to the post-human. As part of the book, I've dealt with, I've seen 10 concepts, 10 aesthetic concepts, which are particularly relevant. Um, um, but here I will highlight three of them. All the different cultural movements I briefly presented unfold the sense and in different aspects of the life world. They have implications for ethical, social, cultural, as well as aesthetic challenges. And this doesn't mean that it's always possible to clearly assign a specific stance or work of art to one cultural movement. It's not even the case that the artists, thinkers, or engineers themselves have a clear understanding of the various cultural movements, or that they explicitly regard themselves as members of a specific movement. However, due to the cultural analogy, the conceptual awareness of the various cultural movement is helpful for promoting explicit verbal communications on the various is issues which are being tackled by such exchanges on works of art. For example, Stella Arc, um, who's a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Post Human Studies, he has undertaken performances prior to and independently of the various post human discourses, having reached a wider academic audience. 
trans post as well as meta-humanists see traces of their own cultural self-understanding in Stellark's work, and it's possible to do so. It's not part of these reflections to assign a specific aesthetics to the various beyond humanism movements, or to claim that specific artists ought to be interpreted as members of a, of a specific cultural movement. However, here in several types of aesthetics are being dealt with, which often term up in post-human artworks, whereby post-human artworks are the ones which tackle, deal with, and represent themes, materials, approaches, which are often associated with the various post-human movements by aestheticians of the post-human. So I distinguish 10 different types of post-human aesthetics, um, whereby each type is associated in particular with one specific post-human artwork in order to highlight, in order to show um, specific characteristic features. Here, I will address three of them. It needs to be noted there are neither essentialist or exclusive ways of describing a specific work of art. That means a work of art represents the aesthetics of relationality. It can also incorporate other types of aesthetics like bodily plurality. And the following philosophical categorization is mainly meant to highlight specific aesthetic characteristics, which are often found in post-human artworks. So it's interesting to know that aesthetics characteristics are not exclusive to the realm of art. It's possible um, to, to find parallel traces in all aspects of the life world, which reveal important aspects of post-human artworks. For example, post-human artworks no longer count as autonomous, but they are seen as relational with respect to other aspects of the life, life world. And that's, that's where it goes beyond the Frankfurt School uh, aesthetics. The dialectic understanding of the term autonomous art as it was prevalent in the Dorner's aesthetics, no longer applies to post-human artwork. It's no longer the case that it's necessary to stress the relevance, the relevance of aesthetic autonomy, of artistic autonomy by creating autonomous artworks, whereby the ideal case would be the artwork itself creates and represents a new artistic genre. So really being separate from the history of, of art. By artworks being autonomous, the ethical relevance of autonomy gets revealed too, according to Adorno. But Adorno's negative dialectic has been enormous, and Adorno's negative dialectic has been enormously influential in the art world in the second half of the 20th century. Post-human artworks, and this is where they move beyond this aesthetic, they move beyond the necessity of demonstrating such a fictive autonomy. This doesn't mean that autonomy becomes an artistically inappropriate concept. However, aesthetic autonomy, which used to be the distinctive characteristic of an avant-garde artwork is no longer characteristic for post-human artworks. In, in, in my new book, Philosophy of Post-Human Art, I distinguish 10 different types of aesthetics, um, um, but I'm concerned with one specific artwork which closely embodies the distinctive characteristics of the aesthetics being described. And this doesn't preclude the possibility of an artwork also being related to another type of post-human aesthetic. So each description will not only be concerned with central features of a specific aesthetic category, but also reveal traces of respective characteristics as they manifest themselves in other aspects of the artwork. For example, um, Hajime Sorayama's sexy robot, they might embody the post-human aesthetics of smoothness. There's a specific aesthetics of smoothness, which comes in, in the, in the post-human aesthetics and which correlates with abstract geometric forms, lines, circles, and a type of shiny brightness. Par parallel characteristics also distinctive for a specific lifestyle, which goes along with the aesthetics of Apple computers and a smooth body of fully waxed skin. Um, so it already becomes obvious that there are correlating and interrelations between aesthetic preference and lifestyle choices. This might also be a further reason for possible tensions between members of the various cultural movements between critical post-human and meta-humanists and transhumanists. Because maybe the, maybe the tension actually between the various post-human uh, movements don't have to be founded um, so much on actual ethical stances or choices and preferences, but rather on aesthetic tastes, um, on the use of language for expressing oneself, on the logic of thinking, on the cultural pedigree to which one belongs to, all of which are distinctive for the members of the various um, or carry, cultural movements. So members of the various cultural beyond humanist movements are critical of the exclusive validity of an essentialist binary concept, for example, of sexuality. However, this can be formulated in different ways. So it can be traced to the right of competent adults 
to choose their sexual partners, which might be a more transhumanist way of formulating the issue as they have a more linear way of thinking and they're using a more scientific, a more, more trial language um, of rights and duties. And um, However, sexual interaction could also be explained as relational complexes, which are permanently in the process of establishing emerging erotic tensions between contingent nodal points, whereby the reduction of such an interrelationality to issues such as sex and gender has become implausible, which might be a more posthumanist way of formulating a similar insight. So critical posthumanists use a more metaphorical language and a more dialectic way of thinking. Metahumanists, on the other hand, stress plurality, relationality, and becoming essential features of their thinking on sex, whereby some version of metahumanism can be seen as more closely related to taking the issue of permanent becoming seriously, and others are more closely related to finding a middle ground in between the insights of the various cultural movements. So I think the differences are, have more to do with taste, aesthetic preference, cultural embodiment than actually the content um, represented by the various by the various cultural movements. So I distinguish um, 10 concepts. Um, so, but, uh, so each post-human aesthetics, I analyze one specific post-human artwork, which exemplifies this specific type of aesthetics in a particular aesthetic explicit manner. In the context of critical post-humanism, um, the following examples will be dealt with in the book. So the aesthetics of monsters, which is, best represented by, by Patrizia Piccin, Picc, uh, Piccinini's Crayon, and I will talk about it here. Then there's the aesthetics of hybridity, um, where engaged with Eduardo Cacci's Edunia, which is a mixture between um, Eduardo, Eduardo, the, his own DNA, and, and a petunia, a flower. Then the aesthetics of the amorphous, um, well represented in Jaime del Valls, post-anatomical micro dances video, which is actually a, a metaformance. It's not a performance, a metaformance, which again um, disrupts the boundaries between subject and object. Again, a concept which I deal with in more detail in the book. Concerning metahumanism, I, I highlight the following four types of aesthetics. The aesthetics of becoming, well represented by Damien Hirst, thousand years. Uh, the aesthetics of twisting as can be found in stellar second life. I will be concerned with that specific type of aesthetics here in the presentation. The aesthetics of relationality, which comes out clearly in the Randoms International's Rain Room. The aesthetics of bodily plurality, well represented in Hollande's omnipresence. And um, lastly, I'll also be concerned with three types of aesthetics that are particularly relevant when it comes to transhumanism. So here, um, one can distinguish between the aesthetics of superheroines and superheroes in, as, as, as it can be shown in Jeff Koons' Hulk Elvis. And I will, I will say a few words about it here. The aesthetics of smoothness in, in uh, Hajime Sorayama, Sexy Robot, and the aesthetics of kawaii, sort of cuteness, no? um, as it comes out in Mr. Sweet Paintings. I'll start with the aesthetics of monsters as can be found in Patrizia Piccinini's Crayon. I was at a workshop actually in, in Venice for a week um, when the 50s Biennale took place in 20, uh, 2003, nearly 20 years ago. This was the first time when I was directly confronted with artworks by Patrizia Piccinini. Her works there were on display for Australia. And I was particularly fascinated by her sculpture still live with stem cells which played with the Promethean theme of humans creating other humans by means of biotechnologies involving stem cells. It didn't show God attaching a soul to the human body, but it was a little girl who was playfully engaged with giving shape to hum human organic material, which was potentially alive. The organic stuff did not have any clear features of any known organism, but they looked as if a piece of a human body had been rem removed, covered with skin and placed there so that the girl could playfully engage with it and provide it with a further shape so that a creature like Frankenstein could come about. The sculpture of the young family was also on display there. Here we are confronted with a pig-human hybrid lying on the ground, feeding her offspring 
but with eyes watching them like caring human mother and with legs which look just like human legs, getting confronted with a sculpture, it can leave you with a feeling of being disturbed by the monsterly appearance, whereby monsterly doesn't imply that one is getting scared by what one sees, but, but that it's radically different what one gets confronted with in everyday life. Being a monster means to be different, means to not correspond to the normal and means being extreme in at least one specific aspect. The monster challenges our common way of conceptualizing the world. We are all monstrous in some respect. A particularly striking example of the aesthetics of monsters is Piccinini's sculpture Crayon. It has a grotesque, bizarre, and seemingly deformed appearance. However, from a different perspective, Crayon could also be conceptualized as a superhuman. As Piccinini designed Crayon such that it has a high chance of surviving a car crash. Crayon possesses a bigger skull with more cerebral spinal fluid and ligaments to protect the brain in the case of an accident. Instead of a nose, he has two holes which lie flat on his face. His skull is directly connected to the torso without there being a neck in between which, which makes it more resilient. The upper part of the torso has fat coming out in between the ribs, as if there was an airbag incorporated in it. The legs remind the spectator of the robustness of horse legs, which creasy bumps on the back, which seem to protect him better and enable him to jump out of the car energetically. Evolutionary accounts of beauty often explain beauty as a fitness indicator. Crane is particularly fit for being a car driver, as in the uh, not so like unlikely case of being in a, in a car accident, Crane has an incredibly high chance of getting out of the car alive, even in many cases where other humans would not have the slightest chance of surviving. Graham is a particularly fit or well-suited for driving a car as chances are high of him surviving a car crash. Um, he looks like a monster as he's different from the rest of us who would not survive such a car accident. Being different can be an advantage. Being deaf means to be a monster as one doesn't fulfill the expectations of being a normal human being. However, given that the sounds in a specific environment could get too loud and tolerable, then being deaf can be an advantage. It doesn't have to apply for being different and being monster, uh, being, being such that means that you have to be disadvantaged from a, from a survival perspective. And I guarantee we're all, uh, all monsters in, in one way or another. Being a genius might also mean that you're a monster. You know how to deal with mathematical calculations, but you might have hardly any experience in dealing with other human beings. You can program extremely complex algorithms, but it's impossible for you to talk to someone you're erotically interested in. Monsters are different from the norm, yet this being different might enable you to be particularly gifted in one specific field, such that you can use, win the field ma fields medal in mathematics, that you can develop new, new cryptocurrency, or that you can survive a car crash. Monsters become heroes in sitcoms today. Here we have Dr. Dr. Sheldon Cooper from the Big Bang Theory, who was awarded his first doctorate at the age of 16, when has an IQ of 187 and has an eidectic memory, which enables him to hardly ever forget anything. Many aspects of his personality indicate the Asperger syndrome, even though this was not asserted explicitly in the sitcom. All of these features are not normally identified with that of a traditional hero. So they can be defined with a, as a hero of our times. Stephen Hawking was a real life example of being such a hero, despite him suffering from amyotrophic lateral scler sclerosis. It's no longer John Wayne who, who, as Ringo the Kid, rides on the horse and shoots his animals, but is, it's a superhuman nerd you can rely upon who counts as a hero of our time. And these nerds are often associated with the aesthetics of monsters, which has been so clearly depicted in the sculpture crane by Patrizia Piccinini. As here we find monsterly appearance with a special feature of extreme resistance to car crashes. Marilyn Manson also impersonated the aesthetics of monsters, but at the same time also had that of twisting. The example clearly demonstrated it doesn't have to be necessary that one aesthetics excludes the pre pre prevalence of other types of aesthetics. His pale androgynous appearances on his album Mechan Mechanical Animals, on which he also has a track entitled Posthuman, so ex he explicitly addresses the notion of the posthuman, is clearly a monsterly one. 
However, his androgynous appearance as well as his name also represent an aesthetics of twisting, whereby several yarns get woven into new unity. I think the this twisting element is extremely important. So different, several yarns get twisted into a new, get, get, get woven together into a new unit. Marilyn represents a reference to Marilyn Monroe, whereas Manson comes from, from the murderer Charles Manson. Good and evil are being twisted into a new unity in the name of Marilyn Manson. And they're being represented in a monsterly aesthetic which seems prevalent. Still, it needs to be noted that, that the elements of an aesthetics of the twist a significant part of his personality too. Next, the aesthetics of twisting and Stellar's second live performance, which could actually, it's, 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 it's an ideal performance, which could also be working maybe even better in the metaverse. Given a widely shared move towards an ontology of becoming, the plausibility of categorical ontological dualities has been undermined, whereby the most relevant duality has been that of a material mind, souls, or reason, and that of material bodies. There was no immediate philosophical connection between the immaterial and maleness, whiteness, and heterosexuality. Not philosophically, there was no clear connection. However, culturally, these connotations were established and um, have become firmly encrusted structures. So philosophically, there were immediate connections between the immaterial and reason, humanity, and truth. All of these connections are related to varieties of discrimination, sexism, racism, and heteronormativity. They've been culturally established as a consequence of the precious and material mind being related to maleness, whiteness, and heteronormativity. Speciesism, abusive logocentrism, and alithism have been philosophically established as a consequence of the precious and material mind being related to humanity, reason, and the truth. Alithism, Alethism discriminates against anyone who thinks differently from the one presenting aletheia, the truths in correspondence with the world. And this is a violent totalitarian and paternalistic stance, which has had some of the cruelest implications in our cultural history. In the same way as sexism, racism, and heteronormativity have been criticized in many cultural spheres, and speciesism and abusive logocentrism have been argued against in complex philosophical treatises, alethism deserves to receive at least the same amount of philosophical dedication. Alethism presupposes an immaterial mental realm of unchanging forms to which our words, judgments, and insights can correspond. An ontology of permanent becoming undermines the possibility of such an immaterial realm. Does that mean that what remains is a version of materialism? And that's what some critical posthumanists defend. This is where the new materials take, take a very implausible stance. The materials are associated with certain qualities like causality. To dissociate the material from causality means to strip the concept of one of its most basic associations. However, to explain the world purely in causal terms would be too reductionist as well as highly implausible. Living entities have the capacity of an independent generated self-movement of, of a teleology. They strive for a goal and generate the energy to reach it by means of the specific metabolism. Matter cannot explain such developments. Other qualities are needed, and this doesn't imply that a categorically dualistic ontology is needed to explain such phenomena. Yet it, it shows that materialism is not a suitable term for referring to an alternative ontology. If the focus lies solely on the body and flames are being made, the mind no longer exists, we are confronted with the implausible philosophical stance. We do have a mind. The mind is associated with specific capacities like those of speaking, reasoning, counting, also you know, feeling. It would be absurd to, to, um, to claim that we, we should merely be concerned with the body, whereas we can speak, reason, and count, which clearly reveals that we do possess mental capacities. Having all of these capacities identical to having a mind. However, it's an open mind which ontological properties ought to be ascribed to the mind. Traditionally, the mind was identified with an immaterial ontology, non-essentially accessible. It's this association which is no longer plausible. It's an ontology of permanent becoming. The mind would have come about as a result of evolutionary developments. And the mind should be immediately connected with the body in a neo-Spinozian 
psychophysiological unity. Several strands of yarn are spun into a thread. The material and the material come together into psychophysiological unity of permanent becoming. And this is what twisting is all about. In addition, it needs to be realized that a performative self-contradiction occurs when critical posthumanists claim that humanism needs to be overcome. Critical posthumanism aims for non-duality. By overcoming humanism, the duality between humanism and critical posthumanism gets created, and that's problematic. By overcoming humanism, the duality between humanism and critical posthumanism gets created. So by following central claims, you contradict other aspects of your of your of your reflections thinking in non-dualist manner cannot simply I overcoming humanism but has to go along with the process of twisting several sands of yarn need to be woven into a new thread which here has to be a post-human thread Stella's second life performances reveal the aesthetics of twisting in an exemplary manner here Stella his took to a computer whereby one half of his body is stimulated by randomly emitted electronic impulses which by means of which this part of his body gets control. He has no conscious control over it which however does supply to the other half of his body. By means of the sensors he's connected to his avatar in second life. Both his consciously controlled acts as well as the randomly computer generated aspects of his acts are being represented by his avatar in second life. This avatar meets up with several other avatars, and there's usually one avatar which is controlled by a local person, and some other avatars which are controlled by other persons located in different continents, who are all connected via the internet and interact with the avatars in Second Life. The several stands of yarn which bring about the interaction of the avatars in Second Life create this new yarn of digital avatar interaction. The dualities between the mind and body, between silicon-based and carbon-based entities, and between consciously controlled and randomly computer-generated acts get twisted into a post-human yarn of interrelationality. It's possible to the aspects of the aesthetics of relationality, but the aesthetics of twisting is the dominant one. It is not primarily about the relationship, but rather about the coming together of many different aspects, which at least conceptually used to be categorically separated in the humanist past. With a twist towards a post-human present, the separations get blurred such that a unity can be woven together. Philosophically, the extended mind theory, as well as the embodied, embodied mind theory, also perform the twist. In the first case, it gets revealed why it makes sense to conceptualize a smartphone as one aspect of our extended mind. Concerning the second case, it gets ex explained why the mind does not have to be conceptualized as a material, but can have come about as a consequence of evolutionary process. Both insights get further support from, my, from the analysis that we've always been cyborgs, as well as up, we all get upgraded with language by means of parental and cultural education. So we get our language not because of a divine spark, but because our parents upgrade us with language. It's implausible to trace this ability of language to a divine spark, which at fertilization gets associated with the material body. The aesthetics of the twist has enormous plurality of association and is closely associated with the aesthetics of relationality. I'll now come to the aesthetics of superheroines and superheroes, as exemplified by Jeff Kuhn's Hulk Elvis. Non-duality, non-anthropocentrism, and non-essentialism are the determining guidelines of critical posthumanism, which are supposed to be employed when reinterpreting our being in the world. Some radical thinkers, posthumanist thinkers, who associated with this approach regard a world without humans as desirable. As the carbon dioxide emissions associated with humans and the correlated ecological challenges are enormous. Super intelligence, super longevity, and super happiness are often being referred to as the central goals, which are supposed to be technologically realized <coughs> for bringing about the post human from the perspective of many intellectuals who are associated with transhuman. Some leading transhumanist thinkers regard it as most plausible that these goals can be realized best by means of the getting uploaded to a hard drive. Both cultural traditions, if taken to the extreme, have highly problematic implications. Given the short characterization of these traditions, it becomes clear that the aesthetic concepts 
was associated with critical posthumanism are often connected to becoming and blurring, where that transhumanism can also affirm them dynamic ideals. In contrast to former ideals, like humanist ideals, transhumanist ideals are bound to be dynamic, subject to change. A naturalist ontology implies a permanent becoming of everything in all aspects at all times, which undermines the possibility of any unchanging platonic idea. However, dynamic ideals can be presented, which can count as contingent nodal points, which serve, serve as helpful guidelines for a certain period of time, and which might correspond to a specific spirit of our times. This aspect becomes particularly relevant when we deal with the aesthetics of superheroines and heroes, which get embodied in Jeff Koons' Hulk Elvis. Here we even get confronted with two cultural heroes, the Hulk as well as Elvis. The Hulk is a protagonist of various comics published by Marvel. The Hulk came about after the emotionally reserved physicist Dr. Robert Bruce Banner was exposed to gamma rays. From the moment on, Dr. Banner regularly gets transformed into the cream-skinned alter ego Hulk, who possesses an enormous amount of physical strength. Stan Lee, one of the creators of the comic, stated that he was inspired both by Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, as well as by Frankenstein, when developing the figure. Here we can see the cultural traces which go back to the Greek myth of Prometheus, which has been of utmost significance for the various post-human discourses. Mary Shelley's novel is entitled Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus. So the, under, the subtitle highlights the connection to Prometheus. Both for transhumanism as well as for critical post-humanism, the Prometheus myth is, is important. Ia yeah, Passon coined the notion post-human in his article, Prometheus as Performer from 1977. One aspect of the relevance of Prometheus for critical post-humanism is that a duality gets twisted, namely the stealing of the fire and it then being given to humanity. Thus the concept of the divine and immaterial reason gets twisted into a non-dualistic and embodied notion of reason. The concept of humans creating other humans on the other hand, which is central for transhumanism goes back to the ancient Prometheus myth and gets beautifully stated in the final lines of Goethe's famous poem entitled Prometheus. He wrote, here sit I forming mortals after my image, a race resembling me to suffer, to weep, to enjoy, to be clad and thee to scorn as I. Concerning transhumanism, the idea of humans creating other humans, which used to be a divine activity, is central for the reception of the Prometheus myth. Concerning critical posthumanism, the Prometheus myth represents the blurring of dichotomy between the divine and the human. Prometheus has a long standing relevance for the posthuman discourse. And here, there, there's a direct line leading to the aesthetic reception of Kuhn's Hulk, Hulk Elvis. It could also be related to other superhero comics. It's not a coincidence that the protagonists of the Big Bang Theory discuss the relevance of Marvel's Fantastic Four comics, analyze DG Comics' Green Lantern, or regularly attend comic cons dressed up as superhero or superhero. Besides, the Hulk Elvis must also be mentioned, that as Elvis Presley represents an icon of US pop culture, just like Mar Marilyn Monroe or James Dean, is not just a singer, sex symbol and actor, but he was transformed into a cultural icon. Pop culture as well as comics entered the art world. The traditional dualism between pop and high culture has been eroded and can no longer be plausibly upheld. It's part of the post-human twist. In contrast to the aesthetics of the sublime, which was identified with the Frankfurt School aesthetics in the second half of the 20th century, which demanded authenticity and clearly separated the work of art from the realm of popular art, which was seen in, in the context of the cultural industry, post-human artworks no longer affirm such a rigid separation of these two cultural spheres. This shift, shift corresponds to an ontological myth. Adorno as well as Habermas is still assume a rigid, categorically dualistic subject-object distinction and that is highly problematic and which clearly gets highlighted when Habermas transit stresses that most aspects of the human can be analyzed by means of the sciences, but some aspects of the human simply cannot be analyzed empirically. Some remain outside of the sphere of empirical analysis. And this is where the traditional humanism still comes up in, in the Frankfurt school, school tradition. 
with all the problematic paternalistic implications. The great variety of philosophy of a post-human have moved beyond this rigidly dualistic self-understanding. Consequently, the rigid duality between pop and high culture has been undermined too. As a consequence of this ontological shift, the aesthetics of superheroes and superheroines, which comes out in Jeff Koons' Held Elvis, superhero comics, as well as several series can no longer be looked down upon as intellectually valueless creations of the cultural industry. So the natural sciences are getting integrated into the cultural canon too. And this is what the post-human paradigm shift implies. Philip Klaas composed the, 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 the music drama Einstein on the Beach. Michael Nyman wrote the opera Facing Goya. The Pet Shop Boys composed the work A Man from the Future, which was orchestrated by the German composer Swan Helbig, an amazing composer, which deals with the life of the British mathematician Alan Turing. This doesn't mean that thereby new eternal values get created. However, dynamic superheroines and superheroes can come about, which can provide suggestions for orientations for a specific time period. And this is what the aesthetics of Kuhn's Hulk Elvis does too. This analysis reveals that an inverted version of mimesis is at play here. In the platonic world, artists imitate imitations of the perfect forms. Here, artists trade dynamic fictions which can then be imitated in the life world. These dynamic fictions can furthermore be traced to both the life world as well as the realm of fiction. The Hulk has its origin in its comic and Elvis in the life world. Chef Kuhn imitates these two sources by twisting them into works of art which are entitled Hulk Elvis. And this version of Mimesis is associated with the creation of effective dynamic fictions by means of imitating the life world as well as the realm of fiction, which then can be imitated further in the life world as well as in the realm of fiction. And these fictive creations can also be effective in a personal life, humans getting inspired to imitate fiction. But in the legal context, by means of fictive norms and values getting, getting create, integrated into a constitution or in further works of art, they might even be integrated in comical context. Stan Lee's Spider-Man is an incredibly sarcastic hero who is both a nerd as well as a clown, which makes him so attractive as a figure. And this example reveals that even comedies do not have to be seen as moving escapism, which don't deserve to be considered intellectual by intellectuals. The example of Spider-Man reveals that his sarcasm can empower the spectator by revealing the possibility of integrating some desired traits in our personalities too. I'm just coming to my concluding remarks. The above, the above, the former reflections demonstrate an initial attempt at distinguishing different aesthetic concepts of post-human artwork. The first related to critical post-humanism, the second closely connected to meta-humanism, and the final one most closely related to transhumanism. They are neither meant to give a comprehensive picture nor meant to give a detailed description of each of the concepts. They merely represent an initial attempt at reflecting on the meaning of the various aesthetic post-human phenomena we are being confronted with. And these reflections are thinking and doing and creating an action. How, hopefully they already reveal the fascinating diversity of aesthetic concepts which, which we can engage with in the post-human age. And I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing your reflections and your feedback on these issues. Many thanks for your attention. Thank you, Stefan. What an interesting talk. Let's see if anybody has questions. Please just come off mute and participate in the conversation. Oh, Martin. Hi, Martin. Good to see you. Hi, good to see you too. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, I thought that was a very cogent and coherent presentation of a taxonomy, uh, taxonomy of post-humanisms and their connection to specific forms of artistic production. And so I really enjoyed that very much. Uh, I would like to carnivalize the taxonomy though um, by suggesting that one of your categories, and I think it was metahumanism, the uh, embrace of becoming, uh, points to an ontological turn and 
and perhaps even an ontotheological term uh, turn, uh, uh, challenging the fundamental assumptions of the range of posthumanisms and their philosophical as well as artistic uh, um, uh, productions. Uh, so I'm, I'm wondering um, whether I can pin you down about the will to transcendence being an ontotheological grounded impulse um, and whether any of the forms of artistic production and with respect to the taxonomy uh, might um, uh, exist uh, to suggest, I don't want to use the word culture war, but certainly um, um, a, a, uh, um, a disruption at the level of ontology and epistemology. And I'm thinking specifically of, for example, Isabel Stenger's notion of uh, 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 cosmopolitics. And uh, because I've actually been interested in pushing that further into onto theology. And, uh, and so I'm wondering uh, whether that might not be a good place to stop in order to see if I can get a response. Uh, so thank you for your talk. It, it was uh, uh, really productive and uh, I'm, I'm hoping you don't mind uh, this kind of attempt to carnivalize the, uh, uh, the taxonomy. Many, many thanks for that reply. No, I, I agree and I share sort of the resonances of some of the elements of, of what you said, but sort of in also to, to bring some more flesh, some more content to the notion of, of meta-humanism here. Um, it does have that ontotheological dimension, but I don't want to, and this is, this was because becoming was one element. Another element which I mentioned uh, was a perspectival one, and and it is extremely important. And and I I, I want to highlight in particular the perspectival element, and also the sort of this dynamism between this onto uh, ontology of permanent becoming on the one hand, of a non-dualistic ontology of permanent becoming on the one hand, and on the other hand of an epistemology of perspectivism, in the sense of one could it's and and. It, one could wonder, um, and this is one of the reasons, one of the challenges I have if one stresses the material, for example, too much, as some critical posthumanists do, not all of them, but, but there's a sort of, that it's, it's, it's just, it's a new ontology which is being presented without taking the appropriate self-relativizing stance, without stressing, well, it is, it is merely, it is an interpretation. Yeah. And I, I think I, it's, yeah. <laughs> to, to just to demonstrate um, what I'm talking about, uh, to suggest that the, the tensions that I'm describing existed in humanism as well as in post-humanism, uh, in modernism as well as post-modernism. For example, um, uh, the Industrial Revolution in essence was the deployment of time reversible models of time uh, and, and, and dynamical systems in order to control the irreversible um, uh, thermodynamic processes in order to produce work uh, very simply. Um, uh, the reversibility of the engine contains the heat, which produces work, and there are problems with that, uh, 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 in which you know entropy only, always wins in terms of the uh, inefficiencies because of macroscopic parameters, and and particularly with respect to boundary conditions. Um, which leads to the inefficiency and the breakdown of the time reversible machinery. Uh, uh, but the fact is, is that society began to organize itself 
around this this basic um, uh, uh, model of opposition. Uh, and one could argue that totalitarianism and fascism and, uh, and with respect to the war machine is a direct result with respect to World War I and World War II. Um, one could argue that the will to transcendence has its roots in uh, an onto theology, which is modeled by the very mathematics that we use in order to create our, our our, our, uh, our physics, our chemistry, uh, our, our biology, uh, and our engineering, and even our computer science. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, I think this same opposition drifts into the debates that we're having over the nature of posthumanism. Um, but I would like to underscore that the notion of the will to transcendence, which informs all of these. Um, uh, well, most of these approaches seems to be, uh, seems, may seem to buy into that older attempt to employ one system in order to control another system uh, in, in order to, uh, in, uh, for the purposes of control. Uh, and, and one of them is, is, is the zero, the other is subject object uh, duality. I mean, uh, we, which is the result the, 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 the distinguished, I, I think sort of the distinction difference um, between the sort of the traditional humanist approach. And you're right, there are both elements of transcendence, but sort of the transcendence in the humanist sense, I have the transcendence into a non-material non realm, into something which is non-empirically accessible. But after this post-human term, we became this, you know, humans became fully integrated into this world of becoming, but we're no longer categorically different from the rest of the natural world. And that has a lot of, you know, that has a lot of implications on and, and legal implications on all different aspects of the life world. But and then, wouldn't that and be it, the transcendence that, that buys into that? There, there is a, maybe just, just a very, in a very sch schematic manner, just to describe it, overly simplifying now the realm of post-human discourses, and what I'm tr what I'm trying to show actually, um, also in this book, sort of um, the different movements take that post-human term, and then the the critical post-humanists um, and they focus on the element of becoming, and 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 they stress this, and they try to recreate. Um, Sort of, they they take, try to take this outcrows of of postmodern discourses, undermining of the truths which comes from the French postmodern discourses. Um, the transhumanists, on the other hand, um, they take evolutionary thinking uh, um, uh, seriously, and they they focus more on you know everything's becoming contingent. Um, everything, also human beings becoming contingent and we can, humans, we can model ourselves. So there are two different elements. And so the one focusing on undermining the truth and, and, and um, perspectivism and the others on, on the permanent becoming. And meta-humanist um, in, in the approach I'm presenting is sort of a way of um, stressing actually the, the element of permanent becoming as well as, as, as of perspectivism as the theory that all philosophical judgments are interpretations um, actually are, are, are like in a cycle, in a, like in a hermeneutic cycle, they're related to one each other. Perspectivism is best explained by an ontology of becoming and becoming leads to an epistemology of, or makes plausible the epistemology of perspectivism. And so by, by taking becoming as the transhumanist element, becoming also as, as everything in, our, in, in who we are is subject to change and we use technologies to, to change ourselves. And then the element of critical post-humanists who stress that you know, everything's interpretation. Um, um, there is, they, they're just focusing on one element and that's why, and, and they are too, uh, they are, um, too exclusive. And actually once they realize once they realize the various implications of their own approach, and they would realize, you know, transhumanism and 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 critical posthumanism are two sides of the same model. They are both moving beyond this categorical 
dualistic um, a duality between the material and the immaterial by twisting the mind and the body together. Um, but they're just focusing on one element and actually they're excluding the other side. And a, a proper ontology of becoming leads to perspectivism or implies, renders plausible perspectivism. And perspectivism is best being interpreted by an ontology of permanent becoming. And so here, uh, and, and, and that's why sort of the hostility, which you can find in the different, there, there is a hostility um, wealth um, on both sides, actually, of these various cultural movements. It's not necessary. It's more related, I guess, to, that's why I try to show it might be more related to sort of an aesthetic choice to one's own, to the self, self identification. This is the tradition to which I belong to. I don't want to belong to that tradition. They are two, 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 two um, linear thinkers. They are not dialect, dialectic enough. It more has to do with a way to conceptualize to yourself. And sort of the meta humanist approach shows no. Um, um, in, in a proper manner, this hostility is not needed. Uh, actually, your goals might be more closely related than you yourselves realize. And I was trying to show that with respect to various ways, new way of dealing with sexuality. Um, the, the, the goals are you know, very, very similar among trans and critical post-humanists, but, but the way the form, they formulate this idea are very different. And the one is, is, is tri has more a trier sound, a very different kind of aesthetic. And the other, others have a more metaphorical poetic sound and, and a, more, a more plurry aesthetics. But in the end, um, so, so when, when, when one engages with these discourses, uh, uh, much less hostility is needed. Um, and, uh, but um, one needs to watch out for the problematic paternalistic implications which go along with the traditional humanism, which do affirm you know, um, this traditional strong notion of truth and correspondence. And that's why I meant the truth is, is uh, alethism, is, is as dangerous as you know, species and racism and sexism. And, and, and it's, it's, it's sort of the dangers are of believing I, I hold the truth. And, 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 and all the various movements actually should, should embrace the version of perspectivism. And thereby one, one has a much weaker approach, a weaker stance concerning the other person's perspective. One, one is, is much less arrogant, much less violent concerning the other. It's a weaker way of thinking, but that weakness is actually the strength. And that's an element which, which I learned from one of my teachers who was uh, Johnny Vatima, uh, a friend and my former also doctoral examiner. So I, I think that weakness can be seen. Johnny, uh, weakness, uh, uh, Johnny Vatimo, Pensiero Debole, weak thinking. He was a student of Gadama. Um, and, and, and so that weakness can actually be seen as a strength if one even takes um, self relativizes sort of epistemologically the, the validity of one's own one one's own approaches in the sense I might be wrong, and and that is helpful though this weakness as as seen as a strength in the as part of the post human discourse. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to take up so much time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you, Martin, for the question, and thank you, Stefan, for your response. Renzo has his uh, hand raised, but it sounds like he's leaving, so I don't know if you want to ask your question before you leave. Yes, I'm still here. Thank you very much. Yes, I, I, I was uh, just to go because I have to go. Uh, thank you, Stefan, for your reading, and thank you, Martin, for the provocation. I like it a lot, uh, because... Uh, as I said in, in the chat yesterday, it was the, the, the anniversary of the disease of Bernard Stiller. And Stiller discussed a lot about the human condition, how we understand human condition in self outside of the biological aspects and inside of the technological aspects. Absolutely. Uh, how we can talk about uh, how go beyond human if we don't have absolute comprehension about this. Uh, internalization of exterior and interior in the, in the human constitution in self. So uh, I read in your, your test, uh, Stefan, the, the manifest that you, that uh, Sefide is sharing with us. And you're talking more about this meta humanism as an identity. Um, but for me, it's, it's a little confused about talking about identity 
beyond to materialisms in this co-constitution that, that are relating in the first time, because identity is, of, is, is part of uh, this upside that is a, a representation of something more than a constitution of something. I, I, I think, at least for me, you know, you know? So uh, I, I want to clarify, how do you clarify this, this idea of identity with constitution? in this in this uh, uh, attending of human conditions uh, uh, as, as you say in, in, in your exposition now so uh, thank you very much uh, this is my question um, okay. thanks a lot for that great question yeah um the actually um identity as a representation can be part of the challenge why is that part of the challenge so it depends on what um, um what the identity refers to if the identity refers to, if it represents, if it's supposed to represent some truths, some platonic ideals, something, some essence, um, then this is where all the problematic, all the problematic uh, implications uh, come from, because it demands this universal validity of an ideal and the uniformity. Everyone needs to fulfill that. That's what the problematic of identity referring to uh, representation. Of, of some kind of ideal. If, the, if, the, if, if, if um, identity is merely meant as a representation of a contingent nodal point, that was part of the revised concept of post-human mimesis I was talking about, I was talking about in, in the presentation. So it, then it's just sort of here artists like Kuhn's or others, you know, presenting a superhero, superheroine um, as a contingent nodal point, as a as a contingent ideal of our times, Stephen Hawking as an ideal of our times, and we identify, we 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 sort of um, relate to that identity. We we might we might engage with it. We might take it even as a, as a you new know, representation which we strive for. But then it's it's something which has just been a created identity uh, to which we relate to. But. Um, um, on the other hand, so in the end, the importance is you now it's this movement away. It's a movement away from any kind of any kind of essentialist ideals, any essentialist normative insight, and any essentialist ethical values. In the end, it means no any norm, any value um, is just a human-made fiction. Everything refers to a creative process. Is being any identity is a created identity identity. It, it was created, it was plausible maybe for a certain period of time, it, it, it related to the effects to a certain group of peer group, and then it changes again. And it, it is this, it is the uh, attempt of, you know, taking becoming seriously and, and, and engaging with all the manifold implications of, of permanent becoming in all respects at all times. And it has implications for all aspects of our life well, and we cannot even ima imagine the great variety of implications it has. And that's why, um, and the different post-human approaches deal with different aspects of this undermining of an essentialist idea. And um, so again, bringing together, um, referring that any kind of, you know, any kind of ideal in the end is, is a constituted one, is a, is a human-made one, is a contingent nodal point, and is therefore subject to change again. And so even even what we regard as most plausible, you know, it will most plausible, uh, most probably no longer be plausible and shared within two and after two two hundred years time. That helps us self relativize our stance concerning even our most cherished values and norms, which can be emotionally very difficult. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan. I see Erfan's hand up, and then Alex, if you guys just want to go ahead and ask your questions, feel free. Hey, Stefan. Uh, thank you so much for your amazing talk. Uh, I really liked the way you uh, the way you sort of classified uh, all these different like approaches in uh, like posthumanism and transhumanism. It, it really put it in perspective and it was really like clarifying and uh, i really also like the um the section you talked about the monsters and sheldon cooper I really like sheldon cooper uh 
So uh, I have two questions, actually. The first one is actually about the first part of your presentation uh, in which you um, talked about the relation between post-humanism and post-modernism, which is a sort of an extend, extend of post-modernism. I'm always wondering if uh, uh, there is a relation between post-humanism and non-modernism as the rejection of the legacy of Descartes, maybe. And also, I think uh, uh, I heard that you sort of classified Stellark as um, critical post-humanist artist, right? Not solely, no, no. Um, because I, I, I think is they, they, they can he, be related to all movements, actually. But yeah, exactly, uh, because yeah, so. his work, yeah, he his work is specifically sort of engages with the like breaking the boundaries of what is a human exactly. being. So exactly. I would categorize him as a transhuman artist. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, also, thank you so much, Seppi and Seti, for uh, creating this series of workshops and online seminars. These are amazing. And thank you so much, yeah. uh, so much, Stefan. I can't wait. I can't wait to read your book. Actually, it's amazing. Thanks a lot. Um, no, no. I'm, I'm just, uh, yeah, I didn't want it actually to come across um, that Stella. I, you know, I, I wouldn't identify with one specific or was critical posthumanist. Um, I, I, and I've known Stella for quite some time actually, and we've been talking about that. And I know, you know, transhumanists say, you know, is a transhumanist artist, and posthumanists say he's a posthumanist artist, and and. And I know, I mean, he is, he is friends in both domains in both cultural spheres. And he, he talks at, at events, conferences, um, you know, of both types of cultural approaches. And, but he's been doing his, his approach, his work, his performances, independent of that. He's been doing that for, you know, for 50 years. And, and, and there were interrelations and there were connections with critical post human there were connections with transhumanists, but it's not, it's not, you know, I don't wanna, and he wouldn't want to be classified as, you know, just one of them. He has resonances to all the different approaches. And I think that's, that actually makes sense for a lot of the artists, many of the artists, you know, um, many of the artists who, who are being seen, I mean, there are not many, actually probably one of, if, if one is a proper artist, one, there's not, one doesn't usually say, no, I want to, you know, become just a transhumanist. I want to just highlight one specific insight. Then the danger of being ideological is too strong. So it's normally you get influenced by different kinds of, you know, different kinds of reflections. You find them plausible. They re resonate with your psychophysiological being, with your affects. You, you integrate them in, in your works of art. And, and then you develop, you know, you develop further and change and create something new. That's, and that's why Stella, no, it's, it's not just a critical post it's not just a transhumanist, but he definitely bears resonances to the great variety of post-human discourses. And, and um, yeah, I was very happy that he was, he was writing a really, really kind blurb for, for my book on philosophy of post-human art. And um, yeah, what, what, what you mentioned as the first question actually, um, I, I sort of the difference between um, postmodern and, and cr uh, critical posthumanism as an outcross. Actually, it's 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 a development. It is it is it is not a you know it's not a categorical new development. It's more a shift concerning concerning the focus concerning what one 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 focuses on most. It was respect to Deleuze, to Foucault. There has been a very strong tendency. I mean, postmodernism post has been defined as, as a focus on, on, on perspectivism, on being critical concerning you know, any truths and correspondence with the world. And then with, and then with critical posthumanism, one has focused more on, on the aspect, element of non-duality. And, and so, um, but non-duality was also present in Deleuze and Foucault, elementalism can be found in critical posthumanist. So it is, it is more, it is more, uh, it is more the focus which is which is altered, which is which has been modified. It's not so much the actual overall stance, but more the sort of the the focus has moved to 
to questions which are more of contemporary relevance. And that's why also, you know, there's been talking, you know, about the cyborg or that we've always been posthuman, we've always been cyborgs. Um, and it is, uh, it is more sort of the technology and the focus on talking about technology, human, human animal boundary that has become more prevalent within the critical posthumanist discourse. Um, but there's not such a clear separation from, from let's say, you know, a postmodern thinkers like Deleuze or Foucault. So it's, it's more a gradual shift, the shift concerning focus of what is relevant for us today, rather than a categorical shift. One, one can see the clear, um, the clear development and categorization. But, um, but, but it, the transhumanist is, uh, tradition has been, you know, separated from that. And I'm trying to integrate them and show actually um, both represent two sides of the same two of the same coin, two sides of the same same medal. And you know, uh, if one takes critical posthumanism over the board, then it leads to the position, you know, humans must vanish from Earth. If one takes transhumanism to its extreme, then you 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 affirm mind uploading within 30 years time. And I think both are extremes, which are highly problematic implications, and sort of a more integrated. A more, a more reflective, a more cautious way um, is 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 proper to is would be appropriate to non-dualistic thinking. Thank you so much. All right, yeah, <clears throat> I guess I'll go next. Um, so first of all, hi, Stefan. Hi. Very, very cool talk. You definitely got me interested in in the publication. Very relevant to my interests. I, I guess I'm I'm big fan of like sort of this concept of like have like having a set of aesthetic attractors for um for like uh, philosophy i think that really resonates with me but my question is um if you could go more into like i guess the the transhumanist aspect of like this concept of metahumanism that you've been developing because uh, as far as I see it, like it's very related, like this this whole thing of like becoming and and relativism and like the importance of Heraclitus and Nietzsche, like I associate that very heavily with like um with what you're referring to as like critical posthumanism, um and I see very little of like transhumanism in it, but that may also be because like I'm I guess like one of the people that's like shitting on transhumanism like very very significantly but yeah like if you could go into that as thanks but, a lot but, actually yeah. there has been a lot <laughs> there's a lot of criticism um of transhumanism and um and i mean some of the criticism is is valid and important and i can see in particular if you see some you know if you see some of the transhumanists you know from from silicon valley what they present and there are some really problematic figures peter thiel coming to mind obviously and and, and others as well so i can see the criticism and I, and, and it, 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 there's a valid point to it however and this is i think um what what needs to be considered at the same time here really with transhumanism at the same time um it is it is undermining the traditional essentialist conceptualization of, 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 you know, Christian Kantian um, humanism, this essentialist notion, there's, you know, there's a natural man, there's a natural woman, there's, you know, um, we've got one of the best known um, transhumanism is, is, um, 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 is, is transgender transhumanist Martine Rosblatt. And she's amazing as a person. I mean, she's, um, I mean, she was married to her wife as, as a man in a traditional, a heterosexual marriage for 20 years they had kids together and then and and then um, she uh, she became a transgender uh, woman and and they're still living together they still she's still married to the same to the same partner you know and and um so it's this and she has got the understanding which she shares which we share together sort of the the reduction to of gender sexuality to any binary concept is this is the problematic element we should embrace there are as many genders, there are as many sexes as 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 there are entities, as there are human beings. You know, any kind of reduction is a, pro a problematic one, and it's part of the you know it's part of the transhumanist enterprise, part of the element of morphological freedom to have the right you know to change, to change that, to change the elements of yourself, to change your 
your, 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 the elements of the body, any element of the body, the body becomes a part um, is, 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 and you, to change the elements of the body, not just, not just to become, you know, Superman on Viagra, and that's what most people identify with transhumanism or, or Wonder Woman with Botox. And that's obviously, there is this problematic element of transhumanism, but it, there's also another element of transhumanism which says, no, um, um, right of morphological freedom. People, you know, people should have the right to, 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 to change the elements uh, of their body using the latest technology in the way they want to. And that should be realized by means also, of, this should be realized also by means of maybe uh, um, um, by means of financial elements. So they are not all these libertarian blood sucking vampires based in Silicon Valley, but there's much more diversity. And actually the majority of intellectuals belonging to transhumanism are, are won't belong politically more to the social democratic realm. And they stress uh, the other elements and they are much closer, much more closely related to um, to, to way of thinking, which is very much in, in tune with what critical posthumanists affirm. And there's, so there's a lot of possibility com convergence. Um, what is different is, is the, the, the language they're using. It's more scientific, it's more, they've got a right, there's a dignity, you know, it's more that very scientific, it's a very, very linear way of thinking. So we've got that goal and we should realize it rather than the metaphorical poetic one literary one so it's it's more it's 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 more what i'm trying to suggest is it's more standard it's more based upon choices of style of how you want to be seen and which community you're part of which part of cultural do you do you read foucault or do you do you read julian huxley um or do you read scientific texts you know um and so it's it's less the it, it, both the important issue both are extremely critical that sort of the uh, politics and religious leaders tell us tell us how we should live our lives. It's undermining that essentialism and a, a great plurality should be uh, a great plurality of flourishing should be realized. Um, it might have or it does have it does have critical posthumanism and transhumanism where where they do have different understandings is when it comes to political issues. When it comes to the way to formulating solutions concerning political issues, um, so here transhumanists use more a rights a liberalist rights-based framework, whereas whereas um, critical posthumanists have more the organic community-based framework. So, um, but again, um, and here it's getting interested. And actually, I dealt with, and and, and in that respect, I, I think. There are many good arguments to be made actually why, why the critical posthumanists can learn something from the transhumanists. And that's what I dealt with in the other book earlier, published earlier this year, which was called We've Always Been Cyborgs. Can I um, um, come back in or is there somebody else who would like to ask a question? Did I answer your question, Alex? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let it like flow, okay. uh, however it's... <laughs> If I could suggest a connection between critical post-humanism and transhumanism, um, I'd like to come up with two examples. Um, uh, I've been writing for the last 10 years about jazz, particularly in relationship between embodied cognition and distributed cognition, which might point to a kind of transhumanism that doesn't necessarily fit the category that you presented. Uh, and I call that active distributed cognition. And I, I won't go into details about that. Uh, uh, that. I can leave that for another time. But I used to oppose that with work that I had done earlier on chess and the difference in the structural coupled relationship between agonistic players is that in chess between moves time is frozen and the players have in a sense a moment of transcendence to reflect on possible alternative futures in order to determine how to best control the outcome 
And so, the, so transcendence or timelessness is, is structured into the system, whereas in the functioning of a jazz ensemble, it's not. Now, there's another example I can come up with, which also has time, the contingent and irreversible nature of time. And that would be Eduardo's famous uh, trans uh, 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 telepresence work that he did for uh, an event in Slovenia. Um, where he uh, took a, a seed and put it in a, in a pot full of soil, then watered the soil uh, uh, with water and then put the, the can of soil with the seed in a completely dark room and hung overhead uh, a strobe light and a, um, a see you, see me camera. And then he announced the URL for uh, the CUC me camera on uh, uh, on the on the internet. And what happened is that every time someone clicked uh, on the URL, uh, the strobe light would go on, and so it would be the collective attention. This is what I call passive uh, aesthetic cognition, where the collective attention through time of users of that URL would generate enough light to, to enable photosynthesis, which would then enable the germination and growing of the plant in what I consider to be a, a parody or a satire of Coleridge's notion of organic form. And so that would be an example of time bound passive aesthetic cognition, whereas a jazz ensemble would be an example of time bound um, uh, active distributed uh, aesthetic cognition. So uh, with respect to connecting that to the traditions of critical post-humanism and meta-humanism, which is based on becoming, to the notion of transhumanism, which is this movement from embodied to distributed cognition, how does that fit into your uh, 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 into the taxonomy that you're proposing? Okay. okay. Um, so the entire the, the the first the important point for the for the shift to posthuman thinking. Well, we had we had the understanding. I'm coming to the cognition that. We have the understanding our human nature lies in some essence, which is the divine spark, which is non-material. And then we moved, the human became something, which is we have the divine spark, the rationality is no longer something immaterial, but becomes an embodied mind, the embodied mind theory, the mind as part of the body, as which um, the mind which has come about as part of evolutionary processes, but it's part of the body. There's a non-duality being between mind and body, not a clear substantial categorical uh, distinction between the two features. As a big fan then, of Francisco Varela, I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Then the next step is, is sort of, we realized, you know, we've got 30 trillion human cells, which the body consists in, but 37 trillion non-human cells which our body is being made up. And, and that means we realize, it was re realized that we've got, our body consists of more non-human cells than human cells. And they, they, we can't live without them. They, they are, you know, the bacteria in our guts, in our intestines, um, and they are non-human. Are they part of, we need them to survive. Without them, without these non-human elements, you know, we couldn't continue living. And then we develop as an next step, sort of, yeah, the distributed cognition, the cognition, the smartphone, you know, like the very nice example, sort of friend of mine who's a, um, who needs, uh, uh, um, who had a cochlear imp implant and uses a smartphone um, for, to adapt his hearing capacities to different settings. And obviously if, 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 you know, if a policewoman comes and, and takes away the smartphone, for him, it would be like, you know, harm being done to his body because he suddenly cannot, he cannot adapt his cognitive processes to the environment anymore because the policewoman took away his smartphone. So that's an extension, the extended mind that may even still make up part of the new person. So from, 
the, 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 our, our identity being in something immaterial to now first the body, the embodied mind, the body consisting of more non-human cells and human cells, then the body having, having extended parts, the body um, who we are as being related to, to, to silicon-based parts in the smartphone. And the next step is sort of the avatar in the metaverse, in the digital realm, if, if someone, you know, harms, you know, if there's a, if, if someone sexually crabs your avatar, is harm being done to you in some way? Isn't the avatar also some way of extension of who, you, who your personality is? So we see, um, um, we see, we see from one specific unchanging identity, which was the, the humanist understanding of, of our, our human nature, we come to a permanently changing, a permanently changing entity without any essence, with more non-human parts than human parts, where the boundaries are unclear because the boundaries of our cognition might be, you know, they are in the smartphone, the smartphone is connected via the internet to different parts of the world. There was Kevin Warwick, who was sitting in, 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 in at Columbia University in New York, who was sending out information to his robot hand in the UK. The robot hand was grabbing something with sensors on the fingertips. The fingertips fell the surface of the table, sent the information back to his, to his mind. Him being in New York, feeling via the internet, he was able to feel the surface, what the surface of the table in his office in the UK feels like. Now, now, so we, you know, our, our cognition is distributed in the world via the internet, um, and maybe via, 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 via the metaverse in the digital realm as well. Then, then we we might even be able to disentangle. And now I'm coming to cognition even further. Cognition, and I'm I'm talking about that, and we've always been cyborgs. You know, um, uh, it was wonder the, the the theory was originally developed sort of by um, by Catherine. Uh, Catherine Hales, um, who talks about non-conscious or cognition. And I'm, I agree with this understanding. Um, so cognition can, it is possible, uh, um, cognition is possible or can be possible without, without consciousness. Um, one can, can disentangle consciousness from cognition. Some further arguments would be needed now to, to, to render that plausible. Um, so, but in this way, um, um, the cognition can be even via the smartphone, via maybe even a robot without an embodied robot, an embodied algorithm with sensors can have some kind of cognition without the robot being a conscious entity, having to be a conscious entity. I don't think that's very likely. I don't exclude the possibility, but consciousness in a robot is not something I find very plausible within the forthcoming decades. Um, and so, here we see um, the movement from human nature, from a fixed entity, essentialist entity in the in the non non empirical realm, to something blurry, which is part of this world of the sensual world, where the boundaries are not clearly defined. Where it might even be the case that you know it belongs to non human parts belong to the human, and that is part. You know, this is this part of reconceptualization does not only belong to, to critical post-humanism and meta-humanism, that is also part of the, of, of, of the transhumanist enterprise. What the transhumanists on the other hand do is then they have a different focus. Their focus is not so much on the, they don't, most transhumanists at least don't focus so much on this reconceptualization, they focus on the normative elements. So which rights or which duties does someone have, should someone have, um, in, in, in uh, how how they want to use their body. So, but in general, because the majority of transhumanists self-identifies as naturalist thinkers, they they oh, they doubt this this divine spark, this essentialist entity. And then once you start analyzing the human body in this way, then then the boundaries get entirely blurred. Then we're moving away from us as being you know the rational. Rationality is no longer something special because rationality has come about as a consequence of evolutionary processes. And that's what makes, there's no unified rationality anymore. Rationality, there's your rationality, there's each individual's rationality, but the rationality 
our rationalities are sufficiently similar in order to, you know, to communicate. If I if I say, give me a coffee in a coffee bar, then then the um, uh, barista will will get me coffee. So it works. So rationality is just there for something that works, but it has it has been stripped of the metaphysical implications which the humanists have been affirming. And so um, so I don't I don't. I don't see it clear. There's no necessary, you know, there's no, no, no clear cut difference from how the human is being conceptualized in the critical post human and the transhumanist context. Um, it is more the way of what the focus of the debates are and what um, and how it is being talked about. But um, so the interest is a different one. So that one so, should have the right to use different technologies, but it's not the uh, understanding of, of how, how humans are, are being seen. But I would agree, um, um, many transhumanists might be more, because of their lack of intellectual humanity, humanities, you know, philosophical, literary, tr cultural training, there's a lack of appropriate phrasing concerning that issues. And I'm, I'm, but, but, and this is what I'm, I'm trying to sort of regulate. I'm trying to, to show that, you know, so much hostility is not necessary. I, I think um, uh, you've underscored the, the value of, uh, of uh, the heuristic dimension to your tax, taxonomy and, uh, okay. and, and uh, really enjoyed it very much. And I hope you didn't mind the questions. So. No, thanks a lot. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Stefan. So we're almost at two hours, but Andre has a question and Alex has another question. So we'll just let you guys go ahead and then we'll bring this conversation to a close. Hey, Stefan, thanks for the presentation. Nice to be at one of yours again. So I was thinking, you know, through the whole conversation, also through what you were saying, you know, this element of continuous becoming and uh, this Heraclitian element that goes with, and you know, that once you experience something, it changes you. And I'm also thinking about art as a way of, you know, sharing the aesthetic with people. Like, what is the thing that gets you to the point of ecstasy? So then I bring you there so we can share within that which delights one another. Now, if you think about, you know, the sort of ontology of becoming and you stretch it a bit, you know, it brings up question to what degree can we actually share the experience with another? because they will, they will get there, they will share, they will be part of the whole environment, but fundamentally given their way of becoming, they will have a different experience than we had, than I had or than you had or whatever. So it's to the point that by breaking down all these sort of normative structures that we had created in the past, it seems that we get to a point where sharing stuff with people in a way in which we can also exchange about the experience uh, starts to break down. So we're more and more, you know, involved in our own lives and we have like a sort of continuous wave, we're like a continuous wave function that doesn't collapse anymore. Right. And exactly. how, how do you address this? I mean, and categories of expression that do not become oppressive, so to speak. I, I agree with your analysis. I fully agree with that. It's it's um, it's the best we can do is is you know what we're doing is we're exchanging metaphors, we're exchanging pictures, we are creating something sort of. But but because that's why I've I've mentioned I, I didn't mention it here. Um, um, in the same that's actually at, at the end of the book on philosophy of post-human art and so in the same way as you cannot step into the same river twice you cannot experience the same artwork twice because you know after you've gone through you've experienced you've engaged with an artwork it changes you and then you've got further experiences and the next time um, you will encounter the artwork the artwork again has been changed by its environment has been changed by your engaging with it. And you have been changed at the same time. So even by engaging with the same kind of relating to the same artwork, it's no longer the same artwork. The problem is already when we talk about that issue because we use the term the same artwork, but that's 
that's a limitation of our language because our language is is constituted in a platonic manner. That's where Platonism, and that's where actually our misunderstanding of there being essential, or the implausibility of understanding that they're essentialist entities comes from. It's a, it's a temptation, is a mis, our, our, we are being misled by our language that when we talk about the justice, that there is actually something corresponding to the justice. And um, yes, exactly. So, so it is even, um, um, you cannot even experience the same artwork twice. It is you're being changed, the artwork is being changed. And obviously um, the way you encounter something, you engage with it, there are certain resonances, there are certain effects, there are something, certain meanings for you, which you based and interpret on the, on the history of your understanding. Um, but someone else might engage with that artwork in, and have a completely different and different elements resonate and find, you know, create a strong, strong effective resonance, a strong oscillation. Because what happens are per permanent oscillations between nodal points. The nodal points, we are a nodal point, which stresses again that we are also, we are, there's no essence, no identity, but we are also a, a contingent entities in the end. And, um, and the problem, um, um, and, and, and the problem is more of a pragmatic one in the sense of, you know, what do we need to convey properly in the best way possible a specific insight? Then if you, if you address a specific audience, then it might be available. What is the audience you want to reach? What's the audience you want to address? What do they understand? What, what have they read? What have you been reading? How can you find a common basis of oscillation between them and you? Um, it is, and it, it's, it's more a way of hinting, of trying to convey experiences. It's, it's an intellectual, it's an emotional, it's a sensual challenge. And you, you, you work on very different elements of what it means to be human in order to convey sort of what is meaningful and what is important to you. And so that's, that's part of the challenge also. You know, if, if the transhumanists have been reading a lot of scientific literature, it, it can be difficult to people who've been reading a lot of literary studies texts or cultural studies texts. And that's, that's, the, the, that's sort of the gap, which is, can be very difficult to be bridged. And um, does that have to, be, that can lead to problematic, um, a lot of misunderstandings. Um, but in the end, you mentioned something, uh, you mentioned some, did you say paternalistic implications? Yeah, in the sense that the moment, you know, like we codify things, we, and so we can engage with those codified, I don't know, we decide what is beautiful, let's use uh, this example, like we, we have stated what is, what can be talked about as being beautiful. So that way, in that way, we're paternalistic in the sense that you cannot change now the norm that you've given to the word, and you're obliged to use it in that way, and your interpretation is the validity of your interpretation sinks. Okay, thanks. Yes. Um, so that's why I stress al aletheism, mm -hmm. the self relativizing sense concerning whatever you propose is such, a, such an important element of the post human thinking. Whatever you, 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 it's the realization that whatever you propose, that whatever you suggest, whatever you find, whatever gives your life meaning. And you take a you take a distant self relativizing stance to that. You realize you might be this. It might be completely implausible. It might just be you. And you you know this is this is a way of avoiding sort of the imposing factor of taking. It's 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 also it makes it it to avoid the colonialist discourses. You know you pro you talk to China and you say no, it's a human rights discourse. We are superior. We are colonials. We, 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 we will tell you what to do is the right thing to do. And once you relativize your own stance, it weakens the own stance, but it opens up the possibility of further discourses and it, 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 it avoids, it never fully avoids, but it, it weakens the violence or, or reduces the violence your own approach has, your own stance has concerning what others are being what others are suggesting. That's why no matter what the stance, uh, uh, um, this perspectival element is such, a, such an important factor, which was, must never be underestimated. And, and, and I find that particularly interesting. I've had discourses with people who, who, strongly, um, who strongly highlight suddenly the element of, of you know, uh, 
of, of perspectivism. And then suddenly, um, but the way they talk about it is suddenly very forceful. But you know, this is, and this implies this kind of discrimination and in a very violent manner. And I think that's a, that's a, um, a performative self-contradiction, but not with respect to what these people are saying, but with respect to what people, how people say what they this is a chest. And many who, who should know better um, perform or um, uh, um, uh, commit a, um, a performative self-contradiction, uh, 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 perform, commit as performative self-contradiction by acting more violently than what they can justify it with respect to their own thinking. And unfortunately, this is, this is pretty widely shared. And that's why it's, it's even, so also within the discourses, even when one gets very emotional, take a stance, take a distance, don't get aggressive towards the other, take that. And I, I think that's, that's, that's sort of, I guess what you were hinting with the, with the danger of paternalism, which I find extremely um, important and, and problematic when people who should know better take an extremely strong violent stance concerning when defending their own approach. I'm also thinking with what you were saying right now, it's the, the complexity of this post-human approach to conversation, to experience. I mean, it's like if you're talking to somebody and you need to know from where they are so you can engage with them. Like for, for me, I in a way, I also think that it's hard to be able to be a true post-human without a transhumanistic aspect just because of the biological limitation on computation that we have. We might not be biologically capable to handle all this complexity without external computation power and external bandwidth enhancement. Like there seem to be some limits, which I think due to these limits, we have developed the way we have addressed the world. This is sort of a thesis that I'm having in mind right now. And we need to go outside of the biological to be able to you know, overcome these limits and then transform the beautiful theory of non-dualism of post-humanism into actually a practicable reality. Exactly, yeah. The technological options for, for realizing, um, um, for realizing non-dualistic thinking and acting and creating um, must never be underestimated. That's why I'm, 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 I'm advocating, I'm trying to make plausible, no, the transhumanists are not all Peter Thiel's. And you know, there, there's something very important in, in that approach. And there's something very dangerous in, in an overstated uh, uh, critical post-humanist approach, which basically says, um, you know, you, you, it would be best if humans vanished completely from Earth. That's why I think taking to an extreme is it, of both approaches is extremely problematic and, and, and has dangerous implications. And I'm pledging for a weak an open, a prospectival, a self-relativizing discourse, and thereby, yes, an openness, both for the philosophical complexity of critical post humanism but as well as for technological options um, which which go along with what transhumanists affirm yes yeah thank you <laughs> okay go ahead alex uh if yeah. there are more questions we'll um end this conversation after alex so. okay yeah um so something that i think appeared like throughout like these answers um which pertain to my earlier question as well is like um i guess what i've noticed is like this yeah this this language of like loss on one hand like very associated with transhumanism and like th this freedom to do like whatever you want whatever you are comfortable with whatever like sort of fits you versus and i think you're actually quite right to use like uh, I think you used like poetry and a poetic language and self relativization, which is a lot more impersonal. And, you know, like, I guess like, and that fits with the with the sort of philosophical background of this, certainly in like Deleuze, there's like a big force of like, you know, like the, the way that he talks about thought is like as, as like this force that like basically rips you like 
to shreds basically um and i guess that's also where where like i want to hear like your meta humanist stance on this how you like would how you would find a middle ground between this because i think this is like probably like the main sort of hostility here is like whether like certainly i think that like transhumanism is naive because it because it thinks that these processes of like change and becoming can even like possibly continue the same values of, mm -hmm. of everything that we we are and have been yeah, you're right yeah i i i, I um I think that it was a very beautiful way of phrasing the issue. Um, Thanks. No, it, it, and and it it does come down to, for example, um, the traditional humanist stance has held only humans possess a divine spark. Maybe angels do in God, but only humans. That's why humans are persons. Um, then transhumanists pledge for personhood for non-human animals. They say, so respect, we should not only respect humans as persons, treat them with respect, but also dolphins, apes, elephants, some elephants, uh, magpies, orangutans, chimpanzees, and so on. Nine, not, not, at least nine non-human animals, members of, uh, yeah, nine non-human -anim animal species should also be granted personhood. And therefore, as a consequence, which has been done in Argentina, for example, an orangutan has been has been attributed with personhood, and as a consequence, had to be liberated from the zoo. And 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 the the, the criticism of critical posthumanists and of, of that stance is well, then you start introducing you you dualities um, into the notion. Then you say there is someone as a person, and someone other is a non-person. And that's very problematic because you integrate new dualities. That's not actually the case because, um, because um, these, these dualities which are being created have, are being created on a, um, there's a hierarchy which is being created. There definitely is a hierarchy which is being created. Um, but there can be a hierarchy between different degrees of personhood. Um, so it's not a dualistic stance, but it is a hierarchical stance. And why is that hierarchical stance something which is important? Well, on a legal level, on a pragmatic level here, once we want to legally deal with how, whether you should be able to make research on a you know, scientific research on, or, on an orangutan, it's a yes or no decision. The yes or no decision, that doesn't mean that it, it's something which actually ontologically perfectly represents the world. But um, when it comes to legal issues and, and, and pragmatic issues, then, then, then sort of pragmatic decisions become necessary. And it's not, and um, what, what is the, and, and, I, and I think that's what, the, that's what the transhumanists are doing when they suggest personhood for non-human animals. It's not that personhood as a hierarchy of different types of personhood is, is, a, met, is, is a new duality which gets established ontologically. It's a hierarchy, firstly, it's a hierarchy. And secondly, it doesn't have the traditional ontological implications. It doesn't have this metaphysical crowning. This is the only true validity. This is how the world is and how it must be, you know, it must never be changed. Um, that's what I sort of present in, we've always been cyborgs. The proper transhumanist ethics is a, is a, is a, is a fictive ethics. Any ethics which you, and we develop these ethics in order to make you know, legal decisions in order to make pragmatic decisions. Pr for pragmatic decisions, we need to make distinctions, but it would be wrong to conceptualize them as, as, as metaphysical ontological insights between two members of, of two different substances. They are, they, are, they, are, they are useful fictions which are valid for a certain period of time. And that's why I think in this way, actually, I'm, I'm on the transhumanist side. I think it's very useful because in the end, what both members of both traditions do, they want to move away from, you know, this, this hypocrisy of, of attributing, you know, the exceptional status only to human beings. But what do you get? Do you end up in a hierarchy of personhoods or do you end up in an in, in organic complexity? The organic complexity 
ca cannot be formalized. It is it cannot pragmatically be formalized on a legal basis. That is what the, the practical challenge against critical posthumanism is. However, it would also be, it, and if you criticize as you know this hierarchical structure of personhoods as, as a dualistic or as a you know hierarchy, then I don't think hierarchy is, is problematic. That's that might be another element, but um, it's a practical practical necessity. And um, and and what is important is one must not misconstrue the hierarchy as a as an essential fundamental hierarchy, but more as a pragmatic necessity, which is a fiction which is there in order to fulfill a pragmatic purpose for a certain period of time. And I think in this way, I guess the um, so ontological the description of what what critical posthumanism interrelationalism is is. I, that's what I share. But once it comes to once it comes to pragmatic ethical issues, then we need to find a pragmatic basis for creating distinctions. And that's why I think what the transhumanists they do in that respect is is a valid and important approach to uh, to undertake. Do do what, what do you yeah. think? Thank you. Yeah, because um, okay. So I guess my like my thoughts on this are immediately like that. Um, even like the interest in in pragmatics or like in a utilitarian sort of um, expression of what 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 like what both posthumanism and transhumanism talk about uh, is like already a transhumanist interest. Like I think I think exactly. it's like yeah I think I think that's kind exactly. of what what a lot of this uh, comes down to and why sort of like sort of also why why my preference uh, or like my interest is is in the in, is in the useless um sort of exactly. yeah no I, um, I, that's exactly, yeah, yeah I, I agree i mean that's what i that's what i try to say it's sort of uh, what what resonates with you it's it's an aesthetic taste in the end you know this is what what i feel at home with that's you yes. know what yeah, resonates yeah, yeah but i i mean i guess but, but <laughs> like also every everybody would probably like at the, it's kind of my hope that everybody would would try to like would try to assert like their the superiority of their own aesthetic taste like certainly i would like <laughs> i i would i would want to make like the argument here that uh, that it's like that it's a weakening in in a lot of senses to 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 like get a utilitarian anything out of out of philosophy in the first place but you see, this is what you're doing is my taste is better than yours. You're creating the hierarchy. That's where it gets, that's where I think it gets problematic. That's where I think it's important to take the self relativizing stance concerning your own approach in order to facilitate, to, to promote also a less violent stance concerning maybe the other one. You know, for the pragmatic, there there is an important case to be made because in the end, the the you know politics needs to needs to make a legal decision whether we should have research or whether orangutans should be used for research for cancer research or not. Yeah, right. But but that would like that would immediately like entail that that I have an interest in like sort of okay. the pragmatic in the first place. I understand. <laughs> oh, thank you. Such a thought-provoking conversation. Thank you, Professor Sertner, for this discussion and the lecture. Thank you to all of our participants for being here and for the questions and the conversation. Thank you to Foreign Object and Sepide for hosting this event. And yeah, stay tuned for our future events and hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for being here. Thanks a lot for all the wonderful questions. Yeah.